The night came down crookedly on Ambergris, and the slanted darkness and sheets reflected back on itself. It came down like a flood. It smelled of the river. It smelled of mud and reeds. It smelled like the forethought of smoke. Through the winking of the blinkered buildings, the night extinguished itself. But the blinkered buildings kept winking out. The wind that rose up was like an animal. It used the trees as its claws. It suborned the stars for eyes. It needed only eyes and claws to lay Albemuth Boulevard bare. No one walked in that night except the insane and the gray caps with their blood-red flags. At the very end of Albemuth Boulevard, in a small apartment on the ground floor of a tired-looking building, an old couple ate dinner across from each other at an antique table. They could have been seventy or seven hundred from the implacable calm, the senseless peace that occluded their faces. The food on their plates squirmed and wrestled with itself in the dim gas light. Even a gray cap would not have known what manner of meal had been prepared in the small, grubby kitchen. Their plates held a microcosm of the city, filled with a sustenance unrestrained, its movements swift and unpredictable. Her fork skewered a piece of tentacle, still twitching as it entered her mouth. But the creature lurching through her salad greens refused to die. Frightened eyes and clumps and bunches stared up at her from her plate. The woman wore a plain yellow dress that had acquired the antique tint of parchment paper. She had gray-white hair modestly curled, and her slate-gray eyes slid from her husband to her food to the gas light above their heads, but she never stared out the window. Her arms and wrists had a faded delicacy, a clockwork intricacy to them, but her hands were wide and wing-like, especially when she used them to gesture. She moved her lips and words flickered briefly in the space between them before entering her husband's ears. From her husband's mouth came more words, infiltrating her ears with a careless familiarity. Her husband also refused to stare out the window through which I watched them both. He wore a white shirt with a conservative black tie and plain black dress pants. Bald-headed, he had bushy gray eyebrows that gave him a falsely fierce demeanor, reinforced by the abrupt way he stabbed at the food moving on his plate. His hands moved speedily with knife and fork to halt the escape of his food and then pin it down before guiding it to his mouth. Even from the window I could tell dirt had gathered in the whorls of his fingertips. The knuckles of his hands had sprouted unsubtle gray hairs as if in defiance of his smooth scalp. On the table between them stood a single lit candle. By the side of their sharply serrated silverware, each had placed a sealed, wrapped present. I suppose it could have been the celebration of an anniversary, if it did not signify some acknowledgment of the festival. They did not smile as they ate, and who could blame them? Dinner was a grim business, and several times the limbs they guided to their mouths smacked against their lips and tried to grab hold. It was, in fact, a war rather than a ritual, and if they did not relax the vigilance of their stony gazes when the final morsel of flesh had squealed its last, I guess it was because they knew that the darkness could not long contain the festival. The festival would soon extinguish the city's darkness in the most violent of lights, and I myself would soon have to be going, but for a while I lingered at the window for no good reason. Did I need one? The wife cleared the slaughter fields from the table and placed them in the sink. She brought two glasses and a bottle of wine back to the table. After a brief battle with the corkscrew, it seemed reluctant to perform its function, or perhaps the ghosts of their meal haunted them. The husband managed to open the bottle. He poured the amber-colored liquid, frothy as the Moth River Delta, into the two glasses. And only then did their gazes meet, and a secret smile pass between them. They said so much with the smile that I could not catch every word, every nuance of the exchange. And I wanted to unravel that smile. I wanted to dissect it in all of its meanings, for all that it said about this old couple on the eve of festival. The regret, the wry humor, the knowledge of all they had shared together, this I could discern 
and still see reflected in their eyes as they sat back down, wine glasses raised in a toast. She drank her wine smoothly, effortlessly, with such an elegant series of gestures that I deduced she had attended many a social gathering. He, on the other hand, managed to spill the wine onto his chin, where it dribbled onto his white shirt and formed a stain of red. He ignored it, and so did she. He, because he had only the minimum social graces, she, because she had acquired too glittering an array of social graces. In that small non-gesture, I discovered the secret, if any, to their compatibility. Still, they refused to look at the window, whether to negate my presence or the presence of the night, I do not know. But now I sensed a lightness about them, a sudden levity unlocked by the wine, Their hands became less heavy, rose in the air about them like pale birds, and their head movements quickened, accompanied by more rapid eye blinks. He said something that made her blush. She said something that made him laugh. As one, as if remembering for the first time, they pushed their presence across the table at each other. The husband had a childish, greedy expression on his face. Clearly the present meant a great deal to him. Her expression, a thin smile, hid a certain wariness, and I wondered how many times before he had disappointed her. 